Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yasmin Falaker, and I'm a state network manager for SkillSpan at the National Skills Coalition. It's a pleasure to be with you all today as we close out the 2021 Skills in the States Forum. As Michael mentioned, we're excited to use this panel to explore communications and advocacy strategies that can be applied to your coalition's efforts in advancing the policy topics that you've dug into over the last two days. We are lucky enough to be joined today by three fabulous skills families that have lots of insight to offer based on their experience and expertise. To kick things off, we'll have each lead introduce themselves, sharing their name, role, and how long they've been working in the policy and advocacy field. So we can start with Melinda. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melinda Mack. I am the executive director of the New York Association of Training and Employment Professionals, which is a long name from the 70s. It just means we're New York's Workforce Development Association. Um, I have been doing policy and advocacy work um, in many different facets and roles um, since the late 90s. Uh, and it's, for me, I think the most exciting part of what I get to do every day, because it's where we start to see the rubber hit the road and ultimately real change in people's lives. Thanks so much, Melinda. Devante? Howdy, everyone. I'm Devante Lewis. I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Outreach at the Louisiana Budget Project, um, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit policy think and do tank that works on issues that affect low and moderate income families. And um, I've been in the policy advocacy space, uh, just like Melinda, in multiple different facets for probably the last uh, 13 uh, years. And I think it's the most important because it is where we take um, ideas and meet people and turn them into reality. Great. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Dave. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dave Stone. I'm the advocacy officer and lobbyist for United Way of Central Iowa, based in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, we are the largest per capita United Way in the country and have a very strong advocacy program. And I hate to say it, but I've been doing advocacy now for 20 years. Uh, so uh, I can't believe I'm that old, but uh, I do turn 40 here soon. So good morning. How exciting. Happy early birthday. Welcome to the <laughs> club. I just turned 40 last week. Oh, that's so fun. Um, all right, so wonderful. Thank you all for the introduction. So now that we know who we're hearing from today, we can get into some level setting. So as you've heard, each of these leads have years of experience in policy and advocacy. And in their time, they've successfully leveraged communication strategies to advance their coalition's priorities. However, it is important to note that this success is not always reflected through a legislative or administrative win. And that's a big point we wanna make through this plenary. Advocacy is a long game, and oftentimes planting the seeds for policy changes are the most critical steps that advocates can take, and are often the ones that are the least obvious from the outside looking in. So this can include the little steps that really set the foundation for policy changes, um, similar to informing or building public and policymaker understanding about the value of issues you care for, or identifying the right messaging or messenger and the data needed to win public and policymakers support for issues. So when the opportunity arises, a policy change is achievable. Inherently, good advocacy requires good communication, in person or digital, targeted or off the cuff, engagements with policymakers and the public are most meaningful when messages and messengers resonate with whom you're speaking with. So what it takes to reach this sweet spot looks different for every coalition and can look different throughout the year as our world continues to change every single day. So to better inform the work that we are all doing, this plenary has three objectives. We're gonna showcase the strategies that these three skill span leads use to navigate advocacy in their state with a communications lens in mind. We'll share reflections and best practices that can be applied to coalitions of all sizes, regions, and political climates and we'll discuss how to adapt to current events, the wins and the losses that contribute to strategies and success, and the mentality that's really required to approach advocacy through that long game lens. So with that in mind, let's jump right into questions. So to help set the stage a little bit, can each of you share a bit about the unique dynamics in your state that drive your policy and advocacy efforts? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, so I think uh, New York, New York is a, is a weird state, right? If you've paid attention at all to the news, we always seem to have a lot politically going on. Um, we often joke with our colleagues in Illinois how we sort of go back and forth around who's got the most corruption. I think we're winning right now. Uh, but I think in addition to that, we also have the dynamic of having in a massive city 
um, as well as the rest of the state, right? And so in some ways we're, we're similar to many of our peers who have, you know, like a Chicago or a Philadelphia where it sort of sucks up all of the, the air in the room. Um, but ultimately when it comes to state politics, um, the upstate coalition actually drives a lot of the decision-making or has for a long time. Um, in addition to that, I think we also have the challenge where because we're New York, the scale at which we need to do things has to be enormous. It has to be enormous to make change. Um, and so it's really tough to sort of move things that you know could create or plant a seed that may help 200, 300, 500 people. It needs to help 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 people in order for legislators to really start to care or see the value. Um, and sort of the last thing I will say is um, the work overlaps with a lot of advocates. When you have a state with a, with a huge number of people, you have a lot of people who care about subsets of issues associated or, or related to workforce development. And so, you know, the, the goals and roles of like a Western New York, by way of example, sort of collaborative versus Long Island versus North Country, which is up near the, the top near Canada, they're very different. And so it's being able to balance that and bring people together to see where there's more, far more common ground than there are sort of differences. I think those are sort of the big things that are um, maybe unique to New York, but I have a feeling um, both Dave and Devante will say they have the same issues <laughs> in their state as well. Yeah, I'll go next. I mean, I think people often talk about New York and Illinois corruption, but I tell them, don't forget about uh, us down here in the South because Louisiana, um, we are, we're always competing. I think we've had more former governors in jail than anybody else. Um, but I think that's the, the challenge. And I think there are very some similarities to what Melinda just said about Louisiana. I mean, I think um, first we just have to start with the, the obvious. Louisiana is a, a deep Southern state. It's, it's, um, has the second highest black population per capita of any other state outside of Mississippi. Um, so racial politics plays a, a significant role I mean, then we also have the urban rural divide, which I think a lot of people forget. I mean, Louisiana, when you think about it, you, you normally think of New Orleans. Um, and so even though we are not on the size of uh, New York City, we have that very much kind of New Orleans versus the rest of the state, especially our northern rural portions um, of the state. And so it makes sometimes the dynamics challenging because uh, most people think of New Orleans as the black hub. Uh, of Louisiana, even though demographically New Orleans is trending actually wider um, than even some of the northern report portions of our state are along the Delta uh, and the Mississippi River. Um, so those dynamics just on, on, the, on the sheer fact of, of race composition makes sometimes the work challenging um, and complex um, in our state. And so I think what we end up finding out and figuring out is also funders and organizations because of Hurricane Katrina, now Hurricane Ida, really centering in the southern portion of the state, how do you engage where we know workforce development and workforce training is important, which is in the northern corners around Texas and, and Arkansas. So it's how do you bring people to, to remember uh, the northern part of the state because everyone, anytime they think about doing some work in Louisiana says, let's go to New Orleans, let's go, let's go to, the, to the metro city. And, and there's a lot of work to be done um, up further north. And so those are types of kind of this, the, 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 the the racial challenges we face, but also just the severe geographical challenges when you have such a big economic hub versus population in other portions of the state. And so um, that's kind of what we face ourselves when we enter policy conversations is recognizing those two dynamics. And uh, I think I think my, my, my little puppy agrees with me there because she's getting a little excited. I'll go next. Uh, Iowa is obviously a Midwestern state but with an outside role, especially in federal politics because of the first in the nation caucus. And I wouldn't be a good Iowan if I did not apologize about the last caucus. We all took some responsibility for that that night. Um, but you know that does make an outside role in, in po politics for us at the federal level. Um, you know We were the state that helped put President Barack Obama on the map. We were largely a purple state, one of the first states in the nation to uh, legalize gay marriage and other progressive policies. And now we are facing, all politics is a spectrum, a shift in that pendulum back to uh, towards more of the red. Um, our current majorities in both House, Senate, and in the governor's office are all Republican controlled. And uh, we've already been being, moving a little bit more politically divisive in our state with some of the policies we've put in place and then the pandemic happened and so you know iowa is a bit of the wild west when it comes to COVID 19 we have 
bans on masks. We've got bans on vaccine passports or requiring it for uh, employees. Uh, so it, even the pandemic has become a politically divisive issue. Uh, but where we have found success um, is we've faced perpetual workforce shortages here in our state before the pandemic, after the pandemic. And uh, so that has really allowed us to bring together some really diverse partners to the table uh, to really discuss some innovative approaches to really addressing things. And skills, of course, is one of the great pathways forward for us in this area, but not just in, in the, the workforce development, but also the supports like childcare, housing, um, uh, incomes themselves, and things like that are new for us, like broadband access or high-speed internet access for populations who need it for virtual education or virtual work. Thank you all for sharing more. Um, I think, Dave, you're hitting on something really interesting, which is thinking about how these dynamics in each of your states really affect the way that you have to think about advo advocacy and communication strategies and what really are the best tactics needed to inform decisions. Um, Melinda and Devante, could you each speak a little bit more about what that looks like in your states, given the context you just provided? Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. And I have to also second what Devante said, because we also have the challenge where most of the philanthropic support, um, just generally for all things, but in addition to workforce development and of course advocacy work, centers around New York City. Um, so it makes it really difficult. It was really difficult to get funding to support uh, work in Albany, which has a direct impact. State policy has a direct impact on the ability of New York City to, to function and implement much of the vision that they have. Um, but that sort of leads to who does need to be around the table. And I think that is one of the pieces that um, it's not always the same. It shifts and changes sometimes by the month, the day, the year. <laughs> it definitely shifts and, shifts and changes based on the topic, um, but also um, around who's in political power and where you have the most leverage. And so I think from our perspective, where we've become really successful is to do upfront, like 70% of the work is just listening, listening, understanding, sort of fact checking. So if someone says, hey, listen, I've got a great relationship with so-and-so, we do a little bit of back channeling to find out if that's true. Um, and ultimately make sure that those conversations are more about problem solving than they are about like who gets to be in charge. Because I think one of the, the challenges that typically comes up in these coalitions is who is the face, who is the voice, who gets all of the credit, all of that, right? Um, when really what you need to be a coalition lead is someone who just like knows what's happening. <laughs> you have to know what's going on. You need to know who's talking to who. You've got to be able to keep track. So you really just need someone who's really organized behind the scenes um, who can keep uh, their finger on the pulse. Um, and then finally, I think I will say is as you build your champions, uh, we have found this, and I think Devante sort of shared something similar, like it's such a rotating cast of characters that you have to develop champions that you know you can use that year in the legislature, but then develop a backup and then a backup to the backup. Um, just because you really don't know what's gonna happen or suddenly like uh, that legislator that you've developed uh, as a champion finally gets their, their big childcare bill picked up, right? And you're like, shoot, they're all of their attention is gonna shift and go to that. And so part of this is, you know, making sure that um, you sort of have, again, a, a couple of different strategies. And then the last thing I will share is you have to know what moves your legislative target because a lot of people spend a ton of time doing ex external political rallies or they do a letter writing campaign. And if like your legislator doesn't really care about an external rally or doesn't really care about getting 200 letters and but they really care about social media and what they look like on social media, then you know to divert and spend your time on that social media approach. And I don't think advocates pay a lot of attention to that. They just kind of throw spaghetti and do all of it. Um, but we have such limited resources that we really have to pick and choose in terms of what the best approach is. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think something for us, even though we aren't considered a, a purple state, uh, we, we are interesting in this conversation with Dave and, and Melinda, because well, we are a divided government state. Uh, Louisiana has a as a Democratic governor and a Republican legislator. So even though um, based off of just the pure sh sheer of politics, we would be a conservative state, um, we have now this dynamic, um, which we've seen um, in, in COVID right now of having uh, a governor who is more about protection and uh, with a legislator who's very hostile. Um, and so that has brought uh, one opportunities for us, uh, but also a significant challenge that I think 
Um, people don't recognize sometimes in divided government how just the personal sheer politics, um, no matter what the policy area is, can, can really drive forces uh, between you. And so I think M Melinda hit on a lot of great points about, especially with legislative champions, and, and something that we've taken on is we've really spent a lot of time listening and learning legislators. And, and I think one time, um, often we are looking for the person who may know the most about the particular area. I've been focusing on them. And one of our strategies have been is finding those connective issues um, that we have. So for instance, we've partnered a lot in Louisiana um, with the, the Republican caucus policy chair, uh, because she talked a lot about barriers to work. She was very into occupational licensing. I um, mean, so we always found initiatives around workforce and um, especially about getting students back into college. So we really told her one of the barriers um, for people working and getting into college was um, their transcript being withheld because of unpaid debt. Um, and so even though that was an issue that you would assume more of a liberal member would take because we kind of understood where she stood on, on that kind of overall theory, um, instead of making the, the case that community and college should be free and everyone should have access no matter of their debt, we touched it to barriers to work and showcased that it's a barrier to the workforce and really kind of made that the point, um, which then made her the champion, which also brought um, a different perspective because the Louisiana Budget Project, as we are an advocacy organization, we get often tagged as the, the, the left-leaning policy organization in the state. So uh, sometimes having a more conservative champion is, is beneficial for us. And so looking and, and figuring out ways how you can use legislators where they are saying what um, they would naturally say, but connecting to the issues that you are trying to push forward um, is one strategy that we've really adapted to that has become uh, very beneficial and very uh, informative to the way of how we are really moving policy forward, especially knowing um, the challenges, uh, as I mentioned, in Louisiana, I mean, we, we are the state that almost made David Duke governor. <laughs> so, so we have a, a, a lot of still of that tension, um, even though that's been now nearly 20, 20 something years um, of where you have these political dynamics, especially when we're talking about access to SNAP, access to uh, TANF. Um, the thought of welfare creams really is still a very um, racially driven and culturally driven topic here in Louisiana. So as we talk about access um, to childcare and food and supportive services, we are very cognizant to, to try to connect it to an issue that they're already talking about because we know the, the undercurrent would be to result to the old talking points about who's deserving of, of financial assistance and, and supportive services and not building the case of how we all actually benefit when everyone um, has an equal access to, to success. I'm going to tag on one more thing before Dave pops in, but because I think Devante hit on something so important. I think often advocates who are in this space just tend to talk to the people who are already in favor of the issue. Um, we've actually found some of our most vocal advocates on the other side of the aisle because, as Devante said, you can connect the dots. Like if you care about your local economy thriving in agriculture and you are short on workers, you can connect the dots. And so I think I really encourage people to go into this, recognizing that workforce is in many ways a, an easy issue to sell. It's not like where it's super divisive. Um, and in some ways you have to pay more attention to the other side that may not be in agreement with, with the more liberal view of the issue, um, but ultimately they can become your most avid um, supporters because they find a lot of common ground on it. And most legislators are not out there to get sound bites and most of them are there because they want to create common ground and do the work. And so I think that there's something to be said about workforce being that unifying piece that brings some of those issues together. Absolutely. For me, I think the name of the game is being flexible. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a, an attendee at this conference that wouldn't consider themselves a little bit of a policy wonk. And, uh, you know, one of those things is that we get far too in the weeds and we haven't brought people along on a messaging journey. And I'll call it a messaging journey. Uh, you know, we talked to you, legislator policymaker, two years ago, and we expect you remember everything that we said. And now we're talking about the 201 and 301 level items of this issue. And we and this person doesn't even know us from Adam. You know, those are some of the things we have to consider is that, you know, it's important and we care about it but how do we make them care about it? And so flexibility has been the name of the game. Um, I am a registered state lobbyist. I do enjoy uh, the benefits of working for United Way. 
which has been uh, you know, 150 year old organization that has recognized as nonpartisan. Our donor base is largely conservative. Our actual agenda is very progressive. And so I always joke as a lobbyist, I'm basically a used car salesman. I'm selling the same vehicle, but to one side of the aisle, I'm talking about the cup holders and the other side, I'm talking about what's under the hood, uh, but it's the same vehicle. And so our rigidity, because we're policy wonks, we're data driven, uh, this is what the message of the data is. We have to be flexible with that and look at new ways of talking about these issues. And so, uh, you know, pivots on workforce shortages was really our big click. Uh, we started working with more partnerships with the business community, trade groups, labor, getting them all around the table, a cabinet of adversaries, if you will, because we all had the same goal. We have no workers in this state. And however, our message was, 37% of our population can't meet a self-sufficient household budget in our state. So really it is a skills mismatch. If we invest in workforce supports, workforce development, we'll find the workers for you. It'll take a couple of years, but you'll have them. And so that message really clicked. And you know, just really positioning some of these into more of a nonpartisan approach, so providing a solution to a problem that uh, the conservative side, as well as business, corporate, all faced. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but one of the things is they were experiencing these problems, but they didn't know really what the impacts of things like childcare or housing or affordable internet access meant. They were just seeing it as, well, we put a help wanted sign out, where are the workers? And so really bringing along that messaging journey uh, over a multi-year process really helped us build up those partnerships. As I mentioned before, we are uh, becoming a more divisive uh, partisan state here. And so in the past three, four years, we have faced a lot of public assistance restrictions. And many of you across the country may have faced those as well. Medicaid work requirements, uh, cuts to SNAP, uh, quarterly eligibility things to cut people from the rolls. And uh, you know, in each one of those cases where we were facing a dire straits, thinking that this uh, restrictive, almost draconian bill would move through, we really positioned a lot of skills uh, programs and policies, SNAP employment and training is one of those that we always position as sort of the uh, responsible alternative option to some of these policies. Uh, really the thing we sold is this is a teach a man to fish situation. Instead of cutting folks out, uh, you know, their knees out from under them, uh, let's help them get off SNAP through education training uh, and they'll get a better job. And then, hey, we've also ticked the box on workforce shortage there as well. Don't we all serve the same purposes? So that's where really thinking about that messaging uh, about what would have maybe been seen as a progressive issue in a very conservative environment helped shape and shift. So being flexible, being able to let go of our preconceived notions of what the data or what we've been saying as funders or advocates, allowing that flexibility and openness to go, hey, there's a completely different perspective to this issue. Yeah, all of that is really great. Um, I wanna expand on this piece of flexibility that we're talking about. Um, I think oftentimes you can have the advocacy strategies in place, which might be identifying the data, for example, and making sure that you understand what you're coming to the table with. Um, but as you guys talk about these examples, what I'm hearing that's consistent across all three of your coalition efforts is that who that data comes from, how it's being talked about, when it's even applied to a conversation can change depending on what the political issues are, what the environment is, what opportunities are coming up. And I think that sometimes some of our leads might not even realize that they're using communications tactics to make those decisions um, when they are applying advocacy strategies. And so I think you've all talked about some strong experience embedding communications tactics into this policy work. I want to pause and just expand on this point to say why it's important for other advocates to be a little bit more intentional, intentional about how they're applying comms tactics to their advocacy strategies and, and what that looks like when it's done hand in hand. Um, so I think there's there's like an intentionality, but there's also a consistency that's really important. And I think that's actually more important than necessarily being intentional um, or sort of like dictating who gets to say what, when kind of thing. Um, but I do think, you know, that everyone should be, that's part of your, your coalition of the team that's going out advocating needs to be on the same page as to what data you're using, um, why, why this is important, um, who you're trying to impact or shift or change, um, what policy you're trying to change. Because what I find is this, if you don't have that conversation, um, sometimes people are pulling data that's just relevant to their organization or their constituents, or they're pulling their own information and data, and it may contradict with the larger 
you know, top line data that you're trying to share. Uh, so I think that's one piece. I think the other piece that's super important um, is making sure that you're in agreement around who the messenger should be. Because I think often what happens is everyone runs out and wants to be in front. And in reality, like depending on what legislator you're trying to move, like the workforce people might not be the best messenger. Like it might be way better off getting a head of a union or getting a, an employer or an employer group to be the messenger. Um, and I think that that's really important and making sure that those potential messengers really understand the data you're sharing and why you're trying to connect the dots there, but also listening if they tell you that information is not gonna move that target um, and being flexible and sort of shifting the data that, that's necessary to move that target. So I, don't, I'm, I'm see Dave nodding. I'm hoping that you agree with this, Dave, because I, I really sort of respect what you've been able to do in Iowa. Uh, yeah, I just have to jump in there. Sorry, Devante, but yeah, Melinda, that's so important. We would consider it influencer relationship mapping. And this is maybe an advocacy level 301, but in our state, these are publicly accessible websites. Uh, you know, the state maintains Iowa ethics campaign disclosures. We can cross-reference our advocates, our donors, to who are also donors with our elected officials. Uh, project over the summer, you know, just have them sit down there and figure out who's who and cross-reference. I may not be the message carrier in most situations. I'm mostly the guy who gatekeeps and gets them into the meeting, but knowing that legislator is going to listen to this person more than anyone else is really critically important. We had over-reliance in years on in-person lobby days at our Capitol. I used to have a skills to compete lobby day every year uh, before pandemic. A couple hundred people show up, big breakfast. How effective is that when I put one of their top level donors in the room with them making that ask. I don't need 249 other people at my lobby day if I have the most important influencer to that legislator. I wonder if you, you feel the same way. I feel like lobby days sometimes are more for the advocates than they are for the legislators. Um, because it, in some ways, like it's a galvanizing moment to bring everyone together to get people excited that you're working together on this issue. Um, but often when you do that, the, the legislative meetings are like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, they're not sort of the same it's not sort of the same. Um, and so I don't know if you, if you guys feel the same way, but we certainly do them still too. But Dave, I 100% agree with you. Getting the right person on the phone or in the right room with the right person, that is, although it may be 301 or even 401 level advocacy work, that goes significantly further than just doing a, a out of the blue lobby day. We, we used to host eight lobby days every session uh, from Jan every Tuesday of January through like March, we would have a lobby day. I'd get there to the Capitol at like six o'clock in the morning, get the breakfast ready. It's a photo op. It's a photo op for the policymakers. It's a photo op for the advocates as well. It is largely for advocates first and foremost, because let me tell you on my seventh lobby day, when my buddy, the legislature comes up, he's like, what do you got for breakfast today? Cause I don't need to listen to what you're talking about. You know, really they, they get worn out of it. Uh, so I would absolutely agree. Post pandemic, you know, we had this weird virtual lobby day year. Uh, Post pandemic, we're gonna have one, one in-person lobby day, all everything in the same basket, really for the advocates. Uh, for those photo ops with our elected officials, because the small quiet conversations that will happen on a random Tuesday afternoon with two or three people will really be what drives it forward. But those folks are our advocates as well. It's again, just really shaping and moving that coalition. Where I feel direct grassroots advocacy works the best right now in district as a uh, Policymakers are going to be heading into elections, uh, not necessarily campaign events, but as they're doing coffee forums and sitting at a restaurant listening to constituents, getting a person there in district, hello, I'm a constituent and I care about workforce policies. They don't hear that. That's going to be the thing that they'll remember the whole year long. And when I come back in in January and talk to them at the Capitol, they'll be like, you know, this came up in a tiny town, Iowa, and that's what's going to really drive it forward. So in-person advocacy, I feel, is in district right now. Bringing everybody to the Capitol doesn't feel really responsible or safe right now in this environment. And with limited in-person opportunities, it, it sort of has been something that the legislatures, the policymakers have been looking to get rid of over the years. And now they finally have sort of the, the cover to do so. Yeah, I would totally agree with that point. And something, a strategy that we've done that I think builds upon what Dave just said is, for instance, even in our coalition, sir, when we're talking about SNAP access and, and, and we work with um, the Food Bank Association, what we do is we utilize 
the local food banks to have those pre-conversations that are not connected to the coalition's work uh, with those members in the district. So we, so we make the point about why uh, philanthropy and food banks can't solve food insecurity um, and, and really help with workforce. And so, um, and what that happens is now when the coalition goes and we make those exact same points, it is not my face or the coalition's face. It is that rural legislator in Northern Louisiana remembering when the Northeast Food Bank came to them and said the, the exact same thing. Um, and, and so what we try to do is really kind of utilize, as Dave said, even, even if we aren't going in district, finding in district partners to do a site visit, uh, do an informational meeting with them and kind of pre-give the information that when legislative session comes around and we have a particular piece of uh, legislation we're pushing, they've kind of had that information soaking already um, that came locally and not just from what they would call the the Baton Rouge lobby uh, delegation uh, that sometimes I think a lot of members did. And, and so kind of what we taking that strategy and communications, what we've done also is we've created a district fact sheet. So we've gotten the data um, from, from SNAP and those who are on Medicaid and, and Medicare, how many people are on TANF, what is the cash assistance number? And we've created specific district level one page fact sheets that we can give to each individual member. Because oftentimes when we're talking about these in the communication strategies, we, we paint the picture for the entire state. But as we know, legislators will end up saying, well, that's not my district. Uh, that that, that, that issue is for, for the people over here, the people over there. I, I don't really hear that. And so one of the ways we wanted to really kind of make the connective tissue, even if you haven't heard it, is presenting. So when we are talking about uh, food insecurity, you know just how many people are, are receiving SNAP uh, in your district. And we also flip it thing on the other side, not just how many people are receiving SNAP, but how many realtors uh, are, SNAP, are, are accepting SNAP and how much money they are collecting and the investment in the economy from having a robust SNAP program that is feeding people. And so what we like to do is use the communication style on both sides. So we're not only just showcasing the need uh, for a robust um, SNAP program, we're also showing the investments that it's made in not only um, your parish, but in the, your actual legislative district, how many small business owners are collecting and what's that profit. Um, and so I think that's kind of like one of the, the, the ways we approach that. And, and lastly, I would say kind of the big picture, we've adopted this philosophy of, uh, of always painting the big picture, but knowing that um, you can always adapt. So I like to say that we have a, a bold policy vision that incorporates incrementalism, but we don't make incrementalism our goal. I mean, I think that's often the divide that people have sometimes is like, well, should we really go for the big picture or should we go for the, the small, minute item that may not make a big difference, but is moving the needle? And we say do both. Have, showcase that big vision, but then showcase how moving the needle in these very small areas um, make a difference. So even if we're not tackling everything fully, we're, we're starting um, th that process. And so we, we, we've done that. One of our partners in our coalition um, right, NOLA really focuses on like studying uh, transportation. And so one of the things that we've done creatively and we've used successfully in communication tactics, when we talk about just creating workforce, as Dave was talking earlier about just, it's not about a help wanted sign, is that his research shows how many jobs are available in the city within 30 minutes of public transit versus um, using a vehicle. And, and we show that and we showcase that like, yes, there are jobs there, but if we are talking about people who are relying on the public transportation system in the city of New Orleans, only they can only access 15% of all those available jobs within 30 minutes. And we know that's not a sustainable option for workforce. And so we that's creative ways we've taken the data of transportation and showcase why it's important to have a more holistic view of workforce development because we've created these jobs, we've created workforce training programs, but here this big gap of transportation is illustrated in a way that showcases that's not the only issue was just creating a job that now we have some other work to do to now make people successful and be able to attain these jobs. We, uh, you know, messaging has been a key thing to our policy success uh, with United Way, our skills work as well. Uh, one of the issues that we have worked on since the early 2000s is childcare, uh, but we came at it from funder speak. And this is where that flexibility and rigidity comes in. Uh, you know, we came at it through the lens of early childhood development school readiness, the importance of quality childcare. And we largely had that message for 18 years, more like 15 years, excuse me. And we had to really do a gut check of how little progress down the field we were really making in terms there. 
Is it working for our, uh, you know, our choir of advocates who agree with us? Yes. Is it working with the people who we uh, raise funds from, our donors? Yes. But is it working with policymakers? No, we're just striking the wrong chord with them. And so we really had to do a gut check. Uh, we did use some outside help and we'll talk about it later in this plenary. Uh, but we really shifted how we talked about childcare as a workforce support. We still care about early childhood development quality, making sure those kiddos are ready for school. But really it was demonstrating to the business community, hey, you have perpetual worker shortages. Well, it's because when you opened up that new industrial park in your rural area, you didn't do a childcare map. There's no childcare within an hour of your facility. How are you going to attract those workers? And it was just a click for some people. Um, and that's where we were able to get those business partners in, get the business organizations and trade groups engaged who are very lo uh, loud voices right now in a conservative state. Um, and so as we built that sort of momentum there and really just shifted slightly how we're talking about it, it really allowed us to get some uh, better traction. And I would say really quickly on to Dave's point, I think one thing we've done in communication strategies that it's often scary to do is name the number. Um, I think sometimes when we are trying to get those investments and we're trying to um, have people really see the importance, we shy away from actually saying what it would cost. And I think it makes it harder in the debate. So uh, when you, Dave was talking about child care, it came to my mind um, because we finally said, OK, well, look, we've been trying to get money for child care for years and it, nothing's working. And finally, we said, you know what? It's $86 million. $86 million can get everyone um, under age of four into some early education, our child care seat. And we watched the political dynamics really shift to legislators now really looking towards trying to find uh, that money because now there's a target. Now there's a goal. And oftentimes they think we get scared of saying like, if we throw $86 million out there. Oh, well, no one's going to take it seriously. They're not going to want to do anything. And, and though we didn't get $86 million, we got the largest investment uh, in child care we have seen this legislative session in a long time, because now lawmakers and the public knew where we needed to go. Um, and so I think that's something in communication strategies that oftentimes seems very scary that we don't do, that we should do, is go ahead and just and put the number to the face of what we're talking about. So now we can actually start to move the needle and say like, hey, this session, we we gave we gave half of what we need to childcare. Next session, let's come back and give the other half, rather than just kind of trying to make the case without actually having something concrete for legislators to grab onto. Final thought. I'm gonna on jump in again. Go I'm gonna it. jump in again. I think the other piece that the flip side of that as well is we also need to be super clear of the numbers for the population we're serving as well. So I think a huge portion of the work we have to do around communications is myth busting. We spend so much time out there myth busting around what's really happening or sort of helping adjust the understanding that many legislators and their staff, we should also mention, um, have about a topic or issue. So like a number for us that was super galvanizing was 42% of New Yorkers have a high school diploma more or less. And when we shared that, everyone was like, but our high school graduation rates are so great. This must just be New York City. This must, and then when you start to lay out the data, you said, no, like this is literally pretty much consistent everywhere in the state. Um, they start to recognize like, wait, th that means that 42% of, whoa, how do we get those people, those that's underutilized labor, how do we get them into jobs, right? So it's like, you start to see the connections, the dot connecting, but I think we often, in some ways, sh shy away from being super clear about the population, um, but also sort of flipping it on their heads so people actually really understand who we're talking about here. Like we're not talking about getting more engineers, we're talking about helping people who need economic mobility and economic prosperity. Um, and yes, engineer, we need more engineers, but we actually need more people to be able to even access community college. There's not even a pathway for many of the folks in our state. Final thought on child care, bouncing off Devante there, but we had a lot of success this session in 2021. Uh, we solved in our state, you know, many of you are familiar with cliff effects, but we solved the child care cliff effect in our state. So this is a big caveat. We did a really good job on cliff effect messaging and we've solved it. Now we have to do that sort of retreat moment, gut check, pivoting, because we're gonna lose the momentum on all the other issues of childcare because those policymakers are gonna say, well, we just solved it. Well, you solved the end and we have the middle, the quality, all these other components still to talk about. So that's where that flexibility comes in. And now we, we can pat ourselves on the back for a minute and then recycle and get ready to work again on what's next with this issue just to keep on that momentum.
Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I love all the like head nodding that I'm seeing. And just, I think it's so fascinating that, um, that you three leads have all sort of come to the same shared understanding of the work that needs to be done despite the regional and political differences um, of your coalitions. I think that's fascinating. And I think that you have so much wisdom to share with our leads. Um, I love that you've talked about some of the specific experiences that have led you to this wisdom and this knowledge. Um, bringing it to the present, how did you use some of this wisdom and these experiences in the work of your coalition over the last year specifically? What were some of the communication tactics that you applied with your skills brand coalition? What led you to try that and, and what outcomes did you see? And I know Dave, you just started talking about this a little bit. I would love to expand on that. Pandemic, we have to talk about the pandemic. Uh, that really shifted our advocacy program, which uh, was largely, and especially in our, in our way we do business in this state, a paper and pencil in-person uh, you know, kind of role. Uh, literally, we send paper written notes to our legislature. And, and so suddenly, when we can't even go to the Capitol, how do we really get that sort of healthy conversation on issues going? So we had to pivot very hard to virtual advocacy. And so, you know, we did things like developing new digital uh, trainings for our advocates to really engage them and get them in uh, trained up and feeling comfortable in contacting their policymakers. It's already hard to get everybody to come to the Capitol for a lobby day, and then they may kind of be a bit wallflowers when they're there. This is even different when it's, I have to pick up the phone and call my policymaker. I have to send them an email, a letter. I have to go in person to that coffee. It's a little higher ask than when they're in the group think. Uh, so there was sort of some trainings as well as that. We also expanded into more, uh, you know, uh, traditional and non-traditional media, uh, a lot of guest op-eds, a lot of letters to the editor. Um, I don't know how many podcasts or blog, uh, virtual blog posts I did. My face is all over the internet in Iowa right now of how many I did on different topics, panel discussions, things like that, just to get the issue out. And it really gained traction with some of our local uh, media, uh, both the largest paper in the state and our largest business paper in the state, who then kind of they always host a, a panel discussion on a number of issues. Well, we as a skills uh, expert were always invited to that. Also as sort of the nonprofit uh, voice at a table full of business. That's what our messaging allowed us to get to. We're good message carriers. We have the right data and we're telling the right story. Uh, so, you know, those were in, in, important. Equipping those practitioners, um, you know, our high level influencer making influencers, making sure they feel like they have the talking points they need, a basic understanding of the issues. Um, I wish I could share it with you right now, but one of the things I do is I have a huge legislative agenda. It's on, you know, legal paper, but then I create a pocket version for my top level legis uh, uh, influencers, which may just be a, full, a few bullet points about the issue. Again, that's that policy wonk thing. They don't need to know all the details. They just need to know the problem, the proposed solution, maybe what it costs, and be able to go in there and be able to give just those sort of sound bites to legislators because, as Melinda mentioned, some of those meetings may be 10 minutes. Some of my meetings with legislators may be five minutes. And so getting it all in there and what sticks in between the ears is really difficult. Um, and uh, finally, I would just say that uh, we did do some innovative approaches. Uh, we did some Google ads based on geofencing. I am not an IT guy, uh, but uh, it, it was at the Capitol. So basically, if you were at the Capitol on your phone or on a computer, you would get uh, topic-based ads, uh, which surprisingly was very affordable since we geofenced it to you know a six block radius of our city. Uh, and, and so for less than a couple hundred dollars, we had a sort of perpetual ad campaign going at our Capitol as well on th this past session. So really being flexible, especially with the pandemic has been important. Um, and then I think that a lot of these virtual methods, even as we're moving into a hybrid, maybe going completely back in person, we're still gonna maintain some of these tactics now because they were, they were so effective. It was so easy to get everybody on a Zoom to meet with one legislator, then get everybody to drive to Des Moines in a blizzard in February to meet with that legislator. So I'll leave it there. First of all, I'm stealing the Google ad idea. And I also now know I need to get your autograph because you're all over your, your internet famous. He's our own, our internet influencer for workforce, right? Uh, so a couple of things that, that we did, um, similar to, I think, Dave and also Devante, we, all, we straddle the federal and state work, and so we do both. And as you can imagine, at the beginning of the pandemic here in New York State in February and March, it was an absolute 
show for lack of a better phrase. It was truly a show. And so, you know, between in New York City where there was this huge loss of life and everyone was sort of in a full blown panic mode to um, upstate not sort of feeling the effects. And it was like watching the tidal wave or the tsunami come for the rest of the state. Uh, we, we became like the, the steady voice that was able to translate this is what's happening at the federal level in terms of unemployment insurance, in terms of you know other workforce development benefits, the PUA, um, to the field, but then also to other people who are interested parties that were part of our group or coalition. Um, what then we were able to do down the road is to connect the dots between existing revenue and resources, either from the federal government um, or others, um, and what we need to do to create change based on our policy agenda. And so we actually were able to bring together a group virtually last summer um, to set forth a policy agenda that was taking into context the COVID environment. So how do we have make sure this recovery is more equitable? How do we make sure that we're really focused on actually not just cre creating that incremental change, but this larger systems change? So we're really focused on income disregards. Um, which, again, in our state was not possible previously, but now that we have a Democratic majority in the legislature and a Democratic governor, um, people are interested in it, but they also understand now why income disregards are so important because the pandemic put like a humongous focus um, on people in public assistance. Um, and then the last thing I will say is, uh, you know, we also just, we really kept in touch with legislators. To be frank, like I think they had a lot more time on their hands because they they weren't driving. You know, New York is huge, just like Iowa, like driving to the Capitol, and they were sitting around kind of twiddling their thumbs without a lot to do. So we were actively engaging, keeping them up to date early on in the pandemic around what was happening and having those one on one meetings. And so they came out of this now that they're going to be back in session, hopefully in person. Um, really understanding our issues. And so I, I sort of share that, like, I think we recognize that although it was like a weird downtime for everyone else, that this was a, a, a vacuum that we could probably fill and sort of pump full of our information. And that for us has been really successful. And now we're gonna geotag and Google add them. So they're gonna not be able to get away from it after this. Yeah, I, I would agree a lot with what was said. And I think Louisiana at the beginning of the pandemic is almost was entirely the same, but very different. I mean, um, one of uh, the things they don't think people uh, recognize about Louisiana is that Mardi Gras matters a lot. So <laughs> our legislative session uh, doesn't start until March. Uh, we don't start in January like most other states because we have to give time uh, for Mardi Gras and Mardi Gras parades and the, the entire carnival season. Uh, to enact. So our first real week um, in the legislature in 2020 was the, the week of pretty much the governmental shutdown across the country. Um, we also do off-year elections. So we elect our legislature and our governor in the year prior to the presidential, so not even in the midterms. Um, so this was not only the start of a new legislature where 50% of the House was new, 47% of the Senate was new, we come in for a week and then we go into a global pandemic that forces the entire nation to shut down. Um, and so that was just the dynamics of just starting this work with the new legislature. Um, and then reminding that Louisiana, a lot of our work um, is in frontline workers. Uh, I mean, these are, uh, if you were in New Orleans, you were working at a convention center, you were working at a hotel and hospitality management, you're working um, at a restaurant. So not only did our work um, face a global pandemic, we faced at the sector that was also getting hit uh, with being the most likely to be contagious with COVID-19 and the sector that was having the most governmental shutdown losses of jobs was the area where we spent most of our work doing workforce development, which was in hospitality. So it really kind of uh, changed a lot of how we focused. And I think one of the most important lessons we took from that um, is really about uh, utilizing and narrative building and bringing a face to the numbers into the stories. So uh, I am big on making sure that the people in closest proximity to the issue that we are working on solve or the suffering we are talking about has a voice. And so we uh, really wanted to emphasize um, youth voices. We really wanted to emphasize those frontline workers and making sure they were telling the story, not just kind of some of the hot top advocates who were most likely working from home in the safe environments, 
but these are the workers who are in workforce training programs in these frontline jobs, struggling with childcare, but knowing that they have to still go to the local grocery store, or go to the hotel um, to make ends meet. And so one of the, the, the things we did kind of in, with our Supportive Services Academy um, was really did focus groups uh, and listening sessions um, with those who are in community colleges and, and try to really highlight what were those challenges um, and letting them tell the narrative, letting them tell their story. Because I think oftentimes uh, we forget the, that people who are in poverty, those people who are struggling um, to get access to a better paying job, they don't really need the data. They, they live it. They know it. Um, they don't need us to tell them how many of them they are. They see it. They feel it. Um, and so giving them the opportunity and highlighting them with legislators um, was vastly important. So when it came to unemployment, we made sure to have workers telling the story about why the enhanced unemployment benefits mattered, why they needed it for gig workers in New Orleans who, who didn't have the opportunity because they were contracted um, with the Hilton or the Marriott for uh, certain events, uh, and really bringing life. Um, and dignity to those who we are really working for. Um, and that's a, a, a tactic that I think sometimes we forget because when we talk about legislation, we want to we wanna tell them, oh, this is how you should talk to a legislator. This is how you should dress. And, and we kind of take away the, their authentic truth. Um, and, and that was something we really focused in and leaning in on the authentic truth and the storytelling um, of those who were, were the ones suffering that we were trying to work on. Um, and, and so we've, we've, we've highlighted that and we've really brought that along in, in meetings. Uh, we had a meeting with uh, our, our United States Senator, Senator Cassidy, a few weeks ago, um, and, and we really brought to life those stories, telling the stories of uh, some of our practitioners and their students and what the challenges that like, hey, look, we we're back operating and workforce training, but we can't afford to continue paying Ubers for them to get here. So we need to really focus on. Uh, on public transportation, or we have students who are dropping in and out of the program because child care centers haven't returned because they, they can't retain workers because those workers aren't paid uh, a living wage. Um, and so really making the case to elected officials about what we call the logistics um, of life and the logistics of workforce, that it's not as simple as building another training center, putting together another program and throwing state dollars at it. Um, if people can't navigate working child care, food access and housing security. Um, and so that was kind of one of the ways we really kind of took what Dave uh, and Melinda talked about. And we did run some ads, and, and, and but we did a lot of storytelling. We, we made, uh, when we were talking about the creation of a, a child tax credit in our state, uh, we didn't talk just about a child tax credit. We talked about how it would help someone. And we made a whiteboard video that showcased a, a, a mother of two working and how the additional revenue from the child tax credit would help her be able to continue her education and get a better job. And so the power of storytelling, I think, is something that often is forgotten that really can make a difference. I so appreciate that you guys have started to hit on what your work has looked like um, over the last year and a half, however many months it's been as we've been in this pandemic. Um, our nation has also collectively during that time faced inflection points around other issues that have typically bubbled beneath the surface. Um, racial equity is currently top of mind for many Americans, in part because of the pandemic's impact on Black and Latino workers, but also because of several events that have brought racism to the forefront of policy conversations in a way that I'm not sure we've had to address them before. How has this evolving conversation and interest in racial equity impacted your advocacy and communications efforts over the last year? Um, I'm happy to go first. I think for us, um, we can we feel so much more comfortable being really explicit, really explicit about the fact that this is something that needs to change, but also more importantly that it's at the forefront of all of our messaging. It's at the forefront of um, sort of our push for an equitable recovery, but also around um, calling on legislators to, to pay attention to it. I think many of our legislators as well, including legislators of color, have certainly raised these concerns, um, but have felt um, in some ways not supported, I guess you could say, um, by advocates. Um, and I think it's because we've been sort of dancing around how we bring everyone around the table. I mean, you'd think that DEI would be something everyone would just automatically hop on board with, right? Um, but there's still so many issues in terms of structural racism and other challenges um, that I think, you know, now we feel much more comfortable because we've got the legislators back and the legislators, uh, we, they have our backs as well. 
Um, the other thing that I think is really important is we've also make, made sure, and Devante sort of mentioned this, that there's far more authentic representation around the table. Um, I may not be, again, as a white woman, the, the best person to be delivering certain messages. Um, and so let's make sure that we have authentic representation, people who are ready and comfortable and able to make um, the case uh, for populations that they serve or that they represent. Um, and then lastly, we are making a huge push around how we measure, measure success. Um, we've sort of like undercurrent talked about job quality. Um, we are now very much talking about job quality um, and certainly naming that we need to measure the success of not only the quality of employment, but sort of how we're placing, retaining, advancing people of color in those, those occupations and positions as well. And that we think the state should be measuring this, um, not sort of leaving the onus on individual workforce organizations or individual employers. Uh, that is like, again, a, a bold statement because measurement isn't sexy, but measurement also creates accountability. And that's what I think we've, we sort of recognize we need is far more accountability around this. Yeah, I would say it's it's definitely important, especially in a state like Louisiana. Uh, I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges is that you would assume that um, racial tension and, 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 and focusing on racial justice and racial equity would be a lot harder uh, because of the, the tint and the, the history and the legacy of our state. But then there's also um, uh, a partly a, a silver lining is that because of our state being a third percent black, um, it makes like, for instance, the battles of critical race theory not as successful as you will see um, in some of the more uh, white states because there is such a sizable black population and certain members also, while they may have a conservative district, may have a white district, still have a pretty decent sized black population uh, because you can't gerrymander us all uh, into one area. Um, and so what we've really leaned into, especially under the pandemic was uh, making sure that when we talked about uh, comorbidities, that we, we made sure that we focused that poverty was actually the underlying condition of COVID-19. Um, and, and, that, and that racism was also the underlying uh, condition of COVID-19 and how they directly connect it to the uh, astronomical amount of deaths we saw in the early phases um, of, of Black uh, people and Brown people across this country. And I mean, I think that was the changing of, of really when you saw the uh, anti-mask and, and, and anti-open up and open up the economy uh, rhetoric really started is when we started collecting racial data. Um, and, and people could point to saying like, well, it's not me, it's them. So, okay, open my job back, open the restaurant back, let me live my life because I'm less at a risk. Um, and so that created a, a tension um, and, and we had to own that. And so one of the things that we really lean on is knowing that there is no such thing as a race neutral policy. Um, and, and we have to kind of get rid of the facade that, uh, policy in itself can 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 be above racial approach uh, because they will all impact in some way, form or fashion, racial populations um, in a different way based off of our history of structural racism and policy uh, around this country. And so uh, we really focused on that. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things we know is uh, in Louisiana, a, a lot of our frontline workers were black. Uh, we are talking about uh, black uh, and brown people when we're talking about hospitality workers, uh, frontline workers. And so we had to make the case about why uh, they were at a greater risk because we know of the racial inequalities that exist in housing policies, uh, the, the racial in inequalities that existed in educational opportunities. So even though there are opportunities for them to retrain themselves at our community colleges, we know the financial structures and the way those programs are structured uh, created a barrier. I mean, we also, when we talked about data and something I think sometimes we we don't always do well um, as, as policy advocates is recognizing that we are not just trying to get black and brown people to the level um, of their white counterparts, but we're trying to remove the barriers that exist altogether. I mean, I think that is something we have to lean more into is about recognizing that we're not, we don't want to close the gap of educational attainment between black and white students. We just want every student to be able to have um, a quality, just and equitable education. I um, mean, so we really highlighted that it wasn't just about closing gaps, but it was about removing barriers altogether because that would be an important way um, to move. And, and, and lastly, I would say it was really connecting the dots about how all of these policies interact with each other. And I think that becomes one of the challenges is we often wanna silo 
these issues. We want to solely focus on childcare. We solely want to focus on housing. We solely want to focus on uh, job training. And, 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 and we really leaned into how structural racism plays a role in even that. So if you create a job training program, for instance, I'm in Kenner, which is 15 miles outside of New Orleans, but you don't think about transportation and you don't think about access to a reliable childcare, you've created now a systemic barrier where people can't attain that job training center. And, and, and you wanna wonder why black and brown people haven't really entered the spaces because there are a bunch of other barriers that we excluded from the conversation when we developed uh, this training center. And we said, okay, let's put it on this side of town, not recognizing that, that would there's no bus route that goes that way. So that means they have to have a car. And if we know that people have less access to cars, um, that would be a, a situation or they have unreliable child care. It makes it harder because if they're trying to hit the bus at a certain time, they have to make sure whoever's going to watch their child has it. So we really leaned into making the holistic approach of why systematic approaches mattered, because when we attack the system, we benefit everyone and every person benefits from an equitable system. So uh, that was kind of how we pivoted from um, COVID to really highlighting, and especially now that we know most of the retraining will happen outside of hospitality. We're seeing people saying, you know what? I don't want to work in restaurant business anymore. I don't want to work in hotel management anymore. So we are now reckoning with that as a, as a coalition um, within our racial equity portfolio about how do we how do we now, as some providers who are solely working in culinary and hospitality, provide the skill sets that would allow the students uh, who are entering these job training programs to be able to use them in other careers and other facets? Because we know um, the changing dynamics of the world uh, is changing what uh, opportunities they want to pursue. Uh, as you know, local and national conversations grew momentum around DEI. But we also had an opportunity at our United Way uh, to really look at our mission focus. Uh, we establish a, a 10 year and every decade community goal. And just by happenstance, our, our 10 year goal was, was sunsetting and we were really in the process over the, you know, really a couple of years looking at what would be our mission focus moving forward. And so, you know, I really helped my organization embrace equity as a new long term internal and external goal. And I bring up internal uh, because we couldn't just assume that our staff all were operating at this level with equity. So our first thing was to go back and just do assessment of our staff and really do some paid trainings with our staff on equity uh, because we didn't feel it was appropriate for us to go out and lead in this space in the community if we ourselves had not you know, tended our own fences. Uh, and so we're still on that journey as well um, you know, with varying levels of where we are. That said, the, the Iowa political landscape has really shifted from left to right over the past three political cycles. I personally am a member of the LGBTQ community. We have not put the welcome mat out in Iowa for many different constituencies, uh, but we have a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to uh, racial equity. Uh, you know, During the height of the BLM uh, movement, we, we saw major criminal justice reform enacted at the legislature. Uh, with some changes to probation, fines, fees, prison sentences. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, you know, we saw our state enhance criminal penalties for rioting, unlawful assembly. Uh, we had a back the blue bill that got passed through. Uh, so it was really a mixed bag because then at the same time, we're also working on returning citizens and reentry issues, uh, but we're really not there. Iowa, of course, is largely a predominantly white state, always has been, but has a long history of being really good on equity and racial issues. Uh, you know, since our early founding, uh, we had some, you know, really uh, interesting court cases around racial equity. And, uh, you know, later we have a real um, importance in refugees and immigrants, especially started that out during Vietnam and the Korea and Vietnam wars. So we have a large immigrant and refugee population and demographic shift, especially after this great sentence, census, uh, we are seeing shifts in that direction. However, it is still an urban rural divide. Um, you know, we don't, we, we have larger uh, minority populations in urban centers, not so much in rural areas, even though in rural areas, uh, minorities, immigrants, and refugees are making up a large of the influx of workforce to those areas, primarily because the rural areas are affordable housing, uh, have some jobs available. Uh, and so 
through this whole process, we are incorporating equity into our new mission focus, sort of the lens that we look through everything with. And we're already incorporating it into our advocacy as well. And just in this past year, the first one we did uh, was uh, broadband internet access, uh, high-speed internet access. Uh, we had a derecho come through the state of Iowa. It's an inland hurricane. Let me, it was very crazy, but basically knocked down all of our infrastructure. Uh, most of our trees were leveled, which also meant our old toothpick and copper wires, which we're carrying our internet, cell phones, services, all of that. Uh, so we're 45th in the nation in terms of high-speed internet access because we're largely rural. And then the storm came and knocked it all down. Uh, pandemic, equity, uh, this, this hurricane that we had all kind of led to us going, you know, broadband access is incredibly important virtual learning, continuing education, remote learning. Uh, and at the same time, before the pandemic, before this derecho, we also had urban core areas of our state that had dead zones, uh, just primarily because our providers didn't want to move to an area where predominantly low income people were living and wouldn't access their services. Same issue for our rural folks, because the last mile problem still exists. Uh, a provider would rather put in, the, you know, the last mile of fiber op to a apartment building that's going to have 100 customers, as opposed to that last mile down a rural stretch of road that's only going to ever go to three. So we still have a lot of work to do there. And that was our first bite of the apple really at equity uh, is going with uh, broadband internet access. And of course, workforce supports, public assistance, SNAP ENT, all these things that are pervasive. But again, it's how, we're talking messaging. It's how we elevate these in our environment in which equity is almost a politically divisive issue. And, and it shouldn't be, and that concerns me, and it, it kind of gave me a stomach issues uh, during this last legislative session of like, we're going on a path I don't want us to go, uh, but how do we get it back to the middle and, and again, sell these issues in different ways? I'm just gonna add to on the broadband piece because we also focused on that as a way to, again, address some of the, the equity issues. It's not just around access, it's around affordability. And I think one of the, the pieces that we found is like the, the messaging that was coming from the broadband companies is, yeah, I mean, we, we've done all this broadband investment, we've done X, Y, and Z. Then we find out it's at the lowest possible speeds, um, that it's still too expensive for anybody to be able to access. And ultimately, like you can't be at home with three kids trying to do schoolwork on computers and use, go, you know, go to work virtually and be able to do anything. And so it was, it was interesting for us to start to have those conversations with legislators because it changed the dynamic of the conversation when they realized that like, although in New York, we've made you know, a billion dollar investment around broadband, access and equity are two totally different things. And when you can't afford it, even though it's attached to your public housing authority building, that is a problem. And we need to address that because it means that people aren't gonna be able to go to work or you're not gonna be able to train, you're missing out on opportunities. And so, um, you know, I just wanna sort of underscore, Dave, we had sort of a similar realization and it was a real, I think for us, a really valuable exercise, um, but also more importantly, we actually saw real progress because um, of tackling that issue um, related to equity. And, and quickly, I'll, I'll add, I think that is extremely important. And that was something we highlighted, especially when, uh, as as Melinda was talking about housing, um, when we got the, the early messages about social distancing, it's very hard when, when you don't have access to affordable housing and, and you're living in, in, in communal homes. Um, how, can, how can you stay home uh, from work when you're sick, when you have no access to a paid sick day or, or medical leave if your grandmother or your child gets sick with COVID? And so we, we really talked um, about the racial uh, injustices within that, about just, I mean, we're recovering right now from Hurricane Ida. And one of the things I told people all the time is, how can you tell people to evacuate when they have no disposable income? Are, are, they, paying, are they already in the red just by paying their bills on a normal day um, to then move up uh, and go somewhere and, and afford a hotel room for uh, a, an unknown amount of time? Um, and so uh, we've also adopted it really quickly as we talk about racial equity, the, 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 the movement from just racial equity also to racial justice. Um, and I think that also kind of gets lost sometimes in these conversations and that like racial equity, there's a major difference. Racial equity is typically just kind of the recognition um, of, of racial inequalities. It is the understanding, it's looking at the historical data uh, and making the point, but what racial justice is when we are building that civic 
uh, and political power for impacted communities to utilize that data and, and to really improve their communities with civic engagement. And I think we have to um, recognize that it's not also important in our work to just talk about uh, the racial inequities, but how are we building uh, power for black and brown individuals to therefore take that data and then make these transformational changes uh, and public policies that allow them the opportunities uh, to have access to better paying jobs, to have access to child care, to have affordable housing. And so um, I would really encourage all of the leads to not just look about highlighting where inequities exist, but how are we building power uh, for the, those impacted communities to take that data and really make civic and political changes uh, in their communities. It is so encouraging to hear all of the things that you guys are thinking about and the work that you are doing. Um, at NSC, we strongly believe that a focus on racial equity is critical and pivotal to an inclusive economic recovery. And so I love to hear the work that you guys are doing. Um, this has been such a robust discussion. We had so many things and it's it's been so interesting just to, just to think about these ideas and how it's gonna apply to the work ahead for all of us. Um, thank you so much, Melinda, Devante and Dave for, for taking the time to share your insights and your experience. Um, at NSC, we, we really believe in the power that comes from a network of networks. And so we are hoping that this information and this wisdom and these insights can be helpful to those that are in our network and doing all of this great work. Um, we encourage anyone who has any questions or wants more information on the material presented today to reach out. We can put you in touch with someone on our team or with Melinda, Devante, and Dave themselves. Thank you again so much to our speakers for joining us and thank you to everyone who listened. I am now going to pass it back to my colleague, Michael, to close us out.